This week on The Travel Show. Centennial celebrations in a city of stories. The beauty of Joyce's language, the way he relates to the common man and woman is incredible. How to make your holiday budget travel further. The simplest way to cut costs, don't travel when everybody else is. And closing in on Colombo, Carolus heads for the finish line. That's it, baby. This week, I'm in Dublin, a UNESCO city of literature that's produced a host of famous writers, from Samuel Beckett to Oscar Wilde. But I'm here puzzling over one particular novel that's made the Irish capital a must-visit destination for any book lover. A novel that this year celebrates its 100th birthday. And that book is Ulysses by James Joyce. Now, even though it's widely regarded as being one of the finest pieces of literature of the 20th century, it's also notoriously difficult to read. Now, I've tried, and I must admit, I've failed too, but I am told that if you invest in it, if you flow with its stream of consciousness, it's extremely rewarding. Set over a single day, Ulysses follows two characters, Leopold Bloom and Stephen Dedalus on their journeys across Dublin. Today, there are guided tours that follow their footsteps and help readers make sense of it all. This is Davy Byrne's pub. It's like one of the set pieces in Ulysses. Bloom goes in there, ends up getting a gorgonzola cheese sandwich, <laughs> you know, which even now is sort of fairly hip to the groove, you know. Right, and a glass of burgundy, like, you know. I mean, you're not dealing with muck here. Jack's an actor who's been running these tours for about five years. Men, 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 perched on high stools by the bar, hats shoved back at the tables, calling for more bread, no charge, swilling, wolfing gobfuls of sloppy food, half-masticated gristle, no teeth to chew, chew, chew it, chump, chop from the grill, bolting to get it over, sad boozer's eyes, bitten off more than he can chew. Am I it is a famously hard to read book, but do you think as an actor, you're helping it to come alive? Well, I hope so. It's like waves washing over you. The beauty of Joyce's language, the way he relates to the common man and woman is, is incredible. Many of you might note that these are examples of stream of consciousness, which is a technique that Joyce used. And it's basically like how you think yourself. I'll start off a little thought in my head and then I'll just not finish it because I know where I'm going with it. I don't need to have the whole nine yards and he doesn't either. So he'll half finish sentences and stuff. So you have to keep up. Without Joyce, you know, we'd be missing one of the main planks of attraction to Dublin. His works are all about not just Dublin life, but about life. So, what is it about this city that inspired Joyce and other great writers? To try and answer that, I've come to the old library at Trinity College Dublin, home to one of Europe's most famous literary treasures, the Book of Kells, a 9th century religious manuscript. So here we are, early in the morning, about an hour or so before the public arrive, to see the famous long room, which is just beyond these doors. Whoa, look at this. It's known as the front room of the nation, hosting foreign dignitaries, as well as around one million tourists each year. The ceiling is incredible, and it goes on and on. Must be at least 60 metres or something. You're a librarian here, Helen. Tell me about this city, Dublin. What is it about it that, that inspires so much great literature? I think it comes down to an oral tradition um, and a nation of storytellers. 
um, Dublin itself, you'll see not just Oscar Wilde's statue or Beckett's bridge, but you'll look down and you'll see that there's an inscription of Ulysses in, in, the, in, the, in the pavement, in the sidewalk. It's in the bones of the city. The old library has some 350,000 books and more than half of them line the shelves of the long room. The collection is a vital piece of Dublin's literary heritage, but it's under threat. So with so many books, I mean hundreds of thousands, storage must be a huge problem. Absolutely. These volumes in here, they're our most valuable, they're most valued, they're also our most vulnerable. This is this beautiful library, as you can see. But in effect, we're in a city ring road and all that particulate pollution from all the traffic is coming through the windows and coming and landing on the books. So there is a restoration project going on to deal with exactly that, right? Absolutely. This year, the library has launched an ambitious 90 million euro in restoration to improve the building's environmental controls and help protect the collection. During the project, every single one of these books will be cleaned, catalogued and moved off-site. If you didn't do it, what would happen? Well, the books would deteriorate more. Um, the building already, we know there are structural issues with it. We've got to do it. it actually, there isn't a choice. We absolutely have to do this project. The more damaged or vulnerable items will be treated here, at the Conservation Laboratory. So this is an example from the manuscripts collection. It's a map and here it is being surface cleaned and Clodagh's using what we call a smoke sponge. Mm -hmm. You can see the kind of you know, muck that we get off and then a very fine brush to make sure no debris is left. So over here this book uh, had suffered from the board separating from the text block and it has been rebacked um, with this new piece of leather and the next stage is to uh, look at the pages of the book mm, wow. and in this case there's a running tear so in situ tear repair will happen now just to prevent that from extending through use. So yeah so researchers who are going to be reading this a lot they're going to be turning pages which leads to wear and tear. That's right, so in our treatment we have that in mind and, we, and what we're looking to do is to stabilise the item. We can't leave this collection just sitting on the shelf as, as some kind of backdrop. It's an incredibly valuable resource, you know, it's telling us about our past. It needs to be enjoyed, it needs to be used, it needs to be celebrated. The restoration will provide researchers and tourists with a refreshed experience when it opens in 2026 with new exhibits and a redesigned long room. And who knows, just maybe it'll inspire the next James Joyce. The collection here at Trinity College Dublin is due to close sometime next year. But even if you don't make it in time, there's plenty to do and see around this city. Around 70 million people across the world trace their ancestry back to Ireland and the Emigration Museum celebrates this small country's far-reaching impact. It features the stories of more than 300 Irishmen and women and even offers genealogy appointments to help tourists explore their own family history. For a refreshment, you could stop off at the country's most visited tourist attraction the Guinness Storehouse, which produces 880 million pints of the black stuff every single year. I popped over a few months ago to check out their exhibits and sample their new alcohol-free stout. You genuinely wouldn't know. Well, I genuinely wouldn't know. And if you're a budding Joyce fan, you can't miss the Bloomsday celebrations on June the 16th. This annual festival takes place on the date depicted in Ulysses, and there are events inspired by the novel all over Dublin, including street performances and fancy dress. Stay tuned, because later in the programme, I'll pop into one of the festival's most famous landmarks. Still to come on The Travel Show. Holidays for the hard up. Simon's here with tips on travelling for less. Tuesdays and Wednesdays tend to be the cheapest days to fly on. 
land, a man, a plan, a canal. Carolis spots the finish line in Sri Lanka. Super exciting moment. I'm approaching the Kalaniganga River. Ulysses by James Joyce is a hundred years old this year. Now many people find it impenetrable, but there are a bunch of folk who meet every week here in Dublin to discuss the book's merits and Joyce's genius. So I'm here to find out what's the story. So welcome everyone. This is Sweeney's Joyce in Pharmacy. Sweeney's Pharmacy is one of the landmarks featured in Ulysses and today it's run by a group of volunteers as a tribute to James Joyce. And they all looked, was it sheet lightning? It was darker now, and there were stones and bits of wood on the strand. A fair, unsullied soul had called to him. Now as then, no reasonable offer refused. These readings moved online during the pandemic, but even though the shops open again, they continue to have people tune in from all over the world. The chemist turned back page after page, living all the day amongst herbs, ointments, disinfectants, all his alabaster lily pots. No idea how I read that, but uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> That's what we do here, we read it out loud. You know, we, we have people here from different nationalities, different parts of Ireland, and you hear it in all sorts of sort of music, if you like, but Joyce would have loved that. To make it easy to understand and get into it. Yeah, because it's a book that you grow up hearing about in Ulysses and that it's supposedly so difficult, it's a really nice feeling to suddenly be sitting here and, and it is accessible. And if you want to join in, you can find more information on the Sweeney's website. Hello and welcome to this month's guide. Those cold winter months are almost over here in the UK, but of course events elsewhere in Europe are rightly taking our focus. I wanted to look at how things are affecting the wider world of travel at a time when we're all feeling the pinch and look ahead to what the effects might be in the next few months. The most obvious impact on aviation is the closure of large amounts of airspace. Not just above Ukraine, which is more than twice the size of the UK, but also Russia, the world's biggest country. For decades, flights from Europe to East Asia have traversed Russia. It's the shortest route between hundreds of city pairs. As a result, some airlines are routing flights north of Russia. For example, Finnair is sending some flights to Japan directly over the North Pole. Others are routing them south of Ukraine, though this can add thousands of miles and extra hours in the air. Links between Asia and North America are also affected, with Cathay Pacific saying that its Hong Kong to New York flight could be routed over the Middle East and Europe, rather than directly over Russia and Arctic Canada, turning it into the world's longest flight. Longer flight times plus higher fuel prices spell sharply increased costs for airlines. And while they can't pass that on to the passenger immediately because of strong competition, within a few months I fear you could be looking at higher fares and less choice as airlines cut unprofitable routes. And with all that happening, I wanted to offer a ray of light for people who still want to get away. So here are my tips to help your money travel further. The simplest way to cut costs, don't travel when everybody else is. On a recent Friday night, I paid £200 for a one hour hop from London to Northern Ireland. But then on a Monday lunchtime three hour flight to Lithuania, the fare was just seven pounds. In particular, if you don't have to travel in school holidays, then avoid them. 
Tuesdays and Wednesdays tend to be the cheapest days to fly on and you can also find some good deals on Saturday evening and Sunday morning. Unsurprisingly, fares are often low for flights very early or very late, but apart from the antisocial hours, you might end up spending more on ground transport or a hotel stay. Travel with minimum luggage. This is my cabin bag and it meets all known free hand luggage allowances. Also, ignore those constant invitations to pay for a seat in advance. There's one for you on board, you just don't know which it is yet. Well, that's all we have for this guide. Let's hope there are brighter times ahead for all of us. Join me again next time for the latest in the world of travel and in particular we'll be looking at the joys of journeys by rail as Interrail celebrates 50 years this summer. See you again soon. And to end this week, we return to Sri Lanka, where explorer Karolis Mieliauskas is paddling 50 kilometers down the country's canal network to the capital, Colombo. But he's hit a problem. When we left him last week, his catamaran was letting in water and night was approaching fast. We join him for the final instalment as he crosses the Ngombo Lagoon to a local church. Still a few kilometers to go and the sun is down already. Now is absolutely the time to get out from here and to reach the other shore of Little. I can see already lights. Probably will not manage to reach the place with any kind of light. It looks like it's very close now to the All Saint Church. And the Google Maps uh, shows very good. Hopefully someone is waiting. I cannot really see you, but thanks God I'm approaching the shore. <laughs> Can I park a boat somewhere here? Thanks God. Whew. Good evening, sir. After 14 hours on water, I'm finally here in the Saint, Old Saint Church. And uh, yeah, first of all, I want to thank the guards for possibility to be on the ground. <laughs> Looks like, looks like a party here. Do, do you have a room here? You do have? Okay. May I have a look? Thanks God I have a room for tonight. It's just 200 meters from the church. And yeah, very long day. But thank you, thank you for today. Good morning. So the last stretch in front of me, canal to Colombo. I expect to reach it uh, by the late afternoon today and there's another maybe 12 kilometers. A couple hours of uh, rowing is so nice to see that uh, water actually here it's not uh, dirty at all. Looks uh, very nice. Uh, probably uh, closer to Colombo will be worse, but for now it's rather good. May I have one? Yeah, to drink. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looks amazing, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Mm. So sweet. Woo! Mm. It's uh, rather hot now and uh, really refreshing. As I enter Colombo, sure enough, the canal water becomes more polluted. Unfortunately, most of this litter will end up in the sea.
super exciting moment. I'm approaching the Kalaniganga River, which means canal is over here. 52 kilometers on water, a lot of fragile nature. That's it, baby. Thank you. Three days on water and is done. We just arrived to the Kalanea temple and uh, today people here are celebrating the first visit of Buddha into the Sri Lanka. It happened 2500 years ago. Looks like there will be quite some people here. Over three days I have paddled more than 50 kilometers to get to this dazzling celebration in Sri Lanka's capital. I have seen a canal network which has at times been overwhelmed with pollution, but I have also encountered some amazing spots of natural beauty that have given me wonder and hope. Carolus at the end of his mammoth journey there in Sri Lanka. Right, coming up next week, Adi is in Athens, coming face to face with thousands of years of history and learning about the battle to bring the Acropolis bang up to date. I have never been so happy to see concrete. That is amazing. The last time I was here, this was all rough and gravelly and really hard to push along. So do try and join us for that. In the meantime, don't forget you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and watch past episodes on the BBC iPlayer. I am now going to go off and shelter from the rain and possibly read another page or two of Ulysses. In the meantime, from us all here in Dublin, it's goodbye. Yeah.